Inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lane. Alan, let me make sure I got your strategy right. So you wanted to buy rental properties that were going to produce cash flow now, but also properties that had the potential to appreciate over time. The problem is you live in a very expensive area and the properties just didn't cash flow. So what you started doing was looking a few hours away from home and you found a town that had the potential to give you exactly what you were looking for. Yeah, I actually did. I I wasn't focused on the appreciation up there. I, I had a mentor that taught me it was more important to find uh, cash flow in, in case of in case of bad uh, uh, bad you know hard times. Sometimes the the appreciation is is great initially, but if if things go down, it's not that great. If it's cash flowing though, you really don't have a problem. You just hold it until it goes back up. So I was searching for cash flow um, when I went up there. Actually, I found appreciation and cash flow though. It, it ended up being. Um, it ended up working out really well for me. These areas are all over the place. They're maybe just an hour or two away from where you live. In Alan's case, the area that he found was about three hours away. So on the show today, we're going to talk about how he found the area, how he researched it, what he's been buying. We'll take a look at his numbers and see how everything's been working out for him. Joining us on the show today from West Jordan, Utah, is Alan Larson, We'll take a really quick break. We'll come right back and we'll talk to Alan. It's a lot of work to find a really good rental property. And when you actually find that property, you want to make sure you're working with a lender that can get that loan closed. The lender that I recommend is Chaley Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. She's a nationwide lender and her specialty is helping investors finance rental properties. She has a ton of loan programs and she can find something customized to you for your situation. If you want to find out more or you're ready to get started today, just go to RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E LendingGroup.com. NMLS 42056. Rental Income Podcast. Alan, so you mentioned that you were looking for cash flow. Did you have a a certain dollar amount per rental that you were looking for? Um, Yeah. So so I'm looking for about $200 a door. Um, initially, I feel like that's been a, a pretty standard number and a, and a pretty obtainable number that, um, you know, most people shoot for. It seems mm-hmm. like it's getting harder to find that these days, but that's, that's still about what I shoot for. Okay. Yeah. That, that's a, that's a pretty realistic number, I think for, for a lot of areas. And then, so for appreciation, I, I guess, the, you, you know, it's appreciation is tough because you, you can't count on it. Like, so how, how did you go about finding an area that was likely to appreciate? Like, what were you looking for? I knew that if I could buy something at a, at a discount, that it didn't really matter. If I walked into this property with equity, did I really care if it was appreciating a whole lot? No, Mm -hmm. because I knew that if I needed to, I could go and sell it. Right. And, and so that what was probably that was probably more important to me than figuring out, you know, is this market going to appreciate? Yeah. Now I feel like I kind of know better. Something that's important to me is are people moving there? You can't have your your real estate's not going to perform well if people aren't moving there. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know it at the time, but people were a lot. Lots of people are moving to, to Idaho. Now, were the prices a lot cheaper in the area that you ended up investing in, uh, cheaper than, than the area that you live in? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, that was one of the things that, that was interesting to me is um, I felt like, oh, maybe these are you know more of bargain deals because it's, because it's cheaper. And then I realized, okay, well, it's cheaper, but rents are lower, Um but it ended up still working out a little better numbers wise. It, I, I was able to find c- better cash flowing properties in that market than I was able to find in my own backyard. Now, when you were first deciding that that you were going to get started, like, did you literally say, "Okay, I'm going to buy rental properties. I'm going to find this area. I, I'm going to uh, I'm going to just buy a property." Like, was it was it like an instant thing where where you just did it or was it kind of a a process that you went through? 
Um, I would say it was definitely more of a process. I mean, I didn't come to, I didn't come, I, I knew that I wanted to get into real estate investing. Um, I knew that I wanted to have a different lifestyle where, you know, I didn't have to work as much. I had more time. I had more money to go do things. I, I knew that. Um, but I didn't really know what it was going to look like initially. And I feel like early on, you know, let's say after I bought my first property, it was great. I felt success, but I didn't really see what was coming. It like I, I was I was in the moment, I'm buying more properties. I just didn't see how things were stacking up. I didn't see how each each month, oh, look at this, I just bought this property and I just added nine hundred bucks of cash flow. Mm -hmm. Like eventually it just added up and I was like, holy cow, I got a little chunk there. Right. Yeah, that that's pretty awesome. So l let's take a look at at your portfolio. So how many how many doors do you have right now? I've got 28 doors right okay. now. And how is that broken down? Like do you have single family or duplexes or small apartment buildings? Like what what are you buying? They're all they're all multifamily uh 10 units or less. I have purchased single family properties. Um I've, I've I they didn't work out initially as well as I as I thought they were going to. Right now, everything you own is is a multifamily. Yeah, it's a it's it's between a duplex and a ten plus. Okay, so how many actual buildings is, is that? Oof, that's a good question. It's six <laughs> or seven. I'm not sure. Six which or one seven. It is. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Well, let's take a look at your numbers and and see how how this all works out. So, between your twenty eight units, how much total rent do you bring in every month? Uh, just over twenty thousand dollars in rent. Okay, and you've got mortgages. How much do do your mortgage payments come out to be? They're about seven thousand ninety eight bucks. Okay, and so now for the those are that that's seven thousand ninety eight that's your fixed expenses now for the other expenses for repairs and and vacancy it, it, they can fluctuate over time so like how do you yes. budget how do you budget for that um so i budget i budget ten for ten percent for repairs i budget ten percent for property management although i've 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 I'm not quite paying 10%, but I feel like when you add in some of these other expenses, like releasing fees and stuff like that, it probably still adds up to about that. Okay. So I add 10% for that. And then I also add, add 10% for vacancies right now. Markets are hot. Um, I have hardly any vacancies right now, but it's like you said, things aren't always like that. And I feel like it's good to budget for those things. Mm-hmm. Um, right now I also don't take any of that cash flow. It all goes straight into a bank account and it just pays for, you know, repairs and things I need to do. It just pays for, um, you know, another down payment for a property. So, um, I'm not as concerned about that, but I make sure that those are, okay. that, that we have enough cash flow to right. cover all those things. All right. So for, for your property management repairs, vacancy, whatever else that might come up, that's you're saving like 40% or 30% of the rent. Yeah. I'd say about 30% is, is what we're, okay. we're making sure. Okay. So that's, that's, that's what, like 6,000 a month. Yeah. Okay. So, so you, you've got about $5,600 a month in cash flow. And so you just put that aside and, and that's what you're using for your down payments or to, to continue to grow your portfolio. Yeah. What are your long-term plans for the cash flow? Like, do, do you plan to eventually live off the cash flow? Um, yeah, I would say that's the long-term goal. Um, I mean, that's the reason I got into to real estate in the first place is so I could have more cash flow coming in that I feel comfortable taking that right now having, you know, five grand in cash flow coming in is great, but I, I don't feel like it takes care of if, if big problems come up, what if rent goes down? What if we have a, a recession and there's all sorts of problems? What if that happens and I have to cover mm -hmm. expenses on things? And, and so, um, the goal is to just keep uh, adding to that cash flow bucket and, and, 
I would say within my goal is by the time I'm 35, I'm 29 now. By the time I'm 35, I have enough cash flow. I feel comfortable taking out of there. And, and I think that I think that that number for me right now is probably around 12 grand. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it sounds like you're on a really good path. I, I, I have no doubt that you're going to get there. So l- let's talk about your first deal. So how, how far away do you live from the area that you invest in? Three hours. Three hours. Now, I, I know that you're a realtor. Is this area part of your local MLS area or is this a totally different market? No, this is totally outside of the of of that market. Okay. Um it's it it's in another state. I live in Utah. Um this this property I decided to purchase was in Idaho. Okay. So like how did you how did you go about trying to find deals? That's a good question. So um because I'm a real estate agent, I'm pretty comfortable calling people and asking them if they want to sell their property. And, uh, and, and I had a lot of experience doing this as, as a realtor. And so I actually just kind of transitioned. Um, I said, Hey, I'm already, I'm already doing this. Why don't I call some people up in this area and figure out if they want to sell. And so what I did is I went to, um, I think it was a title company or maybe I went to something like, uh, um, a list creation company, and I got a list of multifamily properties, and uh, I just started calling them. And it wasn't long; like I got very lucky with this list. I think within the first two weeks, I found two deals. Wow! I found okay. my first deal that I ended up purchasing, and I had a, another guy I talked to who said he was interested, and um, I was actually able to purchase this first deal. And shortly after, I closed on that when I purchased the second deal. Now, did, were you screening for people that had owned the properties for a long time or people that had a lot of equity, or were you just literally calling anybody that that owned a, a property in the area? At the time for that list, because it was such a small area, I just called everyone. Okay. And uh, most of the lists I call, I, I, I make sure that they've owned it for you know, at least five to seven years, because as a realtor, I know that most people stay in their, you know, in their properties for five to seven years. Um, and I also look for some things that are older. I'm not, I'm not really looking for a class. I'm looking for some stuff that's older that maybe I can get a value add to. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so when you actually found someone that was interested in selling, how, how did you make sure that you were getting a good deal? Because like you don't know the market as, as well as you would know the market that you, you live and work in. Like how, yeah. how did you know like what, what a good price to pay for the property was? Um, so I, I actually asked the guy how much he wanted for it. He told me the price. I had no idea if it was a good or if it was a bad deal. Um, I had, I had, uh, I had some friends up there that are, uh, real estate agents. I had some friends up there that own property and I went to them and I said, Hey, is this a good deal? Like, I, I want to buy this. I, I don't know. They told me, yeah, Alan, that's a really good deal. I would buy that. And I'm like, well, like some of these people, like, I don't know them that well. I'm like, are they just telling me this? Right, you know? right, right. <laughs> and I, and I feel like, um, I feel like I knew it was at least a decent deal. And, but it scared me. Like I almost, I almost sold that property six times. Like, um, I figured I could probably wholesale it and make like 30 grand and, and, uh, be happy. And finally, um, one of my friends just told me like, I don't look, this is a good deal. Like, this is a deal I would buy. And I was like, okay. And I put it, you know, I actually went to go purchase the property. I called the guy. I said, you know, I've got a three hour drive up there. If I drive up there, are you going to sell it to me? And he said, yes. Wow. So I drive all the way up there. We're sitting down in front of the property. You know, after we looked at it and everything, we're writing up the contract. We signed the first page. There's one more page and he gets a call and it's some other guy that's interested in buying the property. And he says, Oh, I can't sell it to you anymore. I already told this other guy that I would sell it to him. So that was your first time seeing the property. Like you made the offer that day. Yeah, that was my first time seeing the property. Wow. It was it was a very frustrating situation that I drove up there and he didn't sell it to me that time. Right. So did it, did you get to see all the units or were you just looking at the the exterior of the building? He showed me, um, two of the units 
and the rest of his keys wouldn't get him into any of the other units. What was the condition so, like? It, it was very poor condition. Okay. Um, the outside, it, the outside was in very bad condition. Like it was kind of a, a, a stucco outside more, but it was all cracked and had peeling paint and the stucco was falling off and, um, you know, trees were growing up, up next to it and through the power lines up next to it and weighing the power lines down. It looked like they were going to break. It was bad shape on the outside. And then you go inside and it smells like smoke in there. It's the units are disgusting. The walls are disgusting. There's cobwebs and spiders in, you know, on the ceilings in almost every unit. I don't, I just don't get how people were living like that. It was gross. Yeah. So I, so you've got this property that's going to need a lot of work. This is your very first deal. Like, Mm -hmm. did did you have a construction background? Like, did did you know, like, how much it was going to cost you to fix the property up? No, that was my concern. I I mean, I I kind of knew because I had some experience out here in Utah, right? I'm out here working for this guy in Utah as as an agent and an an acquisition manager for him. We're flipping houses. We're listing houses. I'm kind of getting to know um, the cost of things. Um, I had actually, before this point, um, I had gone on bus tours and um, went on uh, like fix and flip bus tours and I they take you around to Home Depot and figure out costs. And, and so before this point, I had kind of figured out, at least in my market where I was at, how much it would cost to do things. But my concern is that I, I thought I was going to have to do a whole lot more to the property to be able to get it in rentable condition than I actually had to. How do you go about like getting the actual work done? Like, Did, did you find local <laughs> contractors to do the work? Now I do, but initially I didn't. Initially, I um, I was trying to figure out what to do. I'm, I'm out there like doing some of the work myself, and I actually had a friend up there who does have more of a construction background, and he's and he also owns some units. And he's like, you know, Alan, I'm going to help you with this. I'll take you through this, um, show you, you know, what I would do. And uh, he brought over one of his workers that works for him, and for a day we actually just started working on painting the unit and putting flooring in there, light fixtures and stuff. And what was crazy is like after doing some of this basic stuff, like it just looks so much better. It went from this is so disgusting to, huh, I I actually might live in this unit. Wow, That's awesome. So how how has it been working out? Um, Yeah. Killer. This is still um, one of my best deals I had ever done. And I just didn't re- quite realize it until, you know, you get to the finish line, you, you finish rehabbing all the, all the units and you're like, okay, you know, what's next? Maybe I'll do a cash out refi and I'll take some of this money and I'll go buy some more properties. Okay, yeah. great. So I go to do the cash out refi and they valued it at, um, well, I'll tell you the numbers. So I, I, I purchased the property at 130,000. It's a small, it's a really small area. There's only 10,000 people that live in this town. And when I went and I put in, I think about 95,000, when I went to go do the cash out refi, it valued at 425,000. Wow. Wow. So you, you definitely got that appreciation you were looking for. And that, yeah, so that's it, like forced appreciation. I mean, you, that, that's not the market. That's you actually going in there and improving the property and making a, a better property. So like, it, it turned out, I think that deal turned out really well because I was able to pull out all of my money I had, had into it plus some, and it still cash flows. And I went and used that money to go buy more property. That's awesome. That, that is the way to do it. So now go, so you did a lot of the work yourself on, on that property, but now for the most recent properties you've bought, you've hired contractors how has that worked? You know, because that always makes me a little bit nervous to to hire contractors, especially you know hiring contractors locally. Like you just never know if they're going to take your money and and rip you off. But when you're Absolutely. an out of town investor, like how do you, how do you have that trust that that they're going to do a good job for you and and not rip you off? Um. I, so so here's what I did initially. 
I, I did the same thing up there that I did down here, which is I created a spreadsheet and I started calling contractors for everything. I've got a spreadsheet for roofs. I've got a spreadsheet for handymen. I've got a spreadsheet for painters. I've got a spreadsheet for uh, flooring, for carpet. I've got all the numbers laid out. Okay, what's the cheapest? Who do I feel like is the most reliable? Who answered their phone call um, when, I, when I called them? Who said they were going to call me and actually called me back? Who didn't? Mm -hmm. And from that... Um, I made some decisions on, on who to try. And, uh, some people worked out and some people didn't. I mean, that's part of this business is you got to make your best decision and you, you eventually just have to try somebody. Yeah. You, you know, you can look online and you can look at reviews and you can see who's got good reviews and who's got bad reviews. And obviously you try and avoid people who have bad reviews, but at some point you just have to make that jump and just yeah. hire somebody. And I got very lucky with one of my, um, it wasn't my first hire, but it was one of my, one of my first few hires that, uh, a handyman that's been with me, that's just done an amazing, amazing job. And, uh, I actually just hired my second handyman, um, within the past month and, and he's been doing a very, very good job as well. But in between them, I've also hired other people that haven't done a good job that haven't hit their de their timelines that have been months off and that that have done a very poor job. So has the distance been an issue like being 3 hours away has has that been an issue or does it not really matter because you have a a local property manager? No, I mean it's still it still is an issue um because I don't have enough units to have a dedicated property manager to all my units handling things, I still have to handle all the things that fall between the cracks. Mm. You know, I, yeah. I could hire some of this stuff out, but it's, it's maybe not worth it. Like for example, last month I, I went and, and rented a trailer and filled it full of appliances and took them all up to, uh, you know, took them all up to my units up there. So uh, it's, it's, it's little things that, that fall through the cracks that you, that you don't think about that, that still have to be done that a lot of times, if you have a larger portfolio, they can handle some of these things. Sure. There's always going to be some work to do or some hassle or aggravation when you own rental properties. But if you think about it, you're being compensated almost $70,000 a year for this little bit of work. And I, I know you're not complaining. I know you love rental properties, but I think it's always good to keep it in perspective sometimes that you are being very well compensated for the work you have to do. If anybody is interested in investing in West Jordan, Utah, like Alan mentioned, he's a full-time realtor and he'd be happy to connect with you and see if he can help you find a property. I've got his contact information on the website. You can track him down at rentalincomepodcast.com slash episode 365. I'd like to thank our sponsor for making this episode possible. It's Chaley Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. Chaley is a nationwide lender and her specialty is helping investors finance rental properties. She has a ton of different loan programs, including her no doc loan, where she doesn't need pay stubs, bank statements, or tax returns. She literally just wants to see that you have a good deal if you do, she'll give you a 30-year fixed rate loan. Now, those rates are going to be a little bit higher than a traditional full doc loan, but if you want to go the full doc way, she can definitely help you out with that too. It's whatever's best for you. And, and that's really the great thing with Chaley. She's got so many different options, so many different ways to figure things out. If you want to talk to her, you can track her down at ridgelendinggroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E lendinggroup.com nmls42056 thank you so much for checking out the podcast today make sure you either follow or subscribe to the show we put out new interviews every single tuesday and if you follow the show you'll get notified as soon as the new episodes come out my name is dan lane and this has been the rental income podcast